Number 10. Submarine Cabin In the Russian city of Vologda, there's a park with a seemingly out-of-place submarine just sitting in the grass, as if it was just plopped there one day for unknown reasons. But the decommissioned vessel was put there on purpose and restored as an attraction for visitors. It can be found at Victory Park, where it functions as both a centerpiece and a museum. Moving the 30-ton diesel-electric powered sub to the site was no easy undertaking. It took a month for the workers to lay the foundation for the display alone. The vessel was delivered in parts, and it took crew around two months to weld them together. Before the submarine was installed at the park, it served in the Russian Navy. It was built during the early 1980s and was temporarily part of the Black Sea Fleet based out of Sevastopol. In 1986, the sub became part of the Red Banner North Fleet based in the city of Polyarny. It had the honor of traveling to the UK in 2001 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the British Royal Marines. The vessel's career may be over, but it's found a new purpose educating the public about the country's naval history. Visitors get the rare opportunity to go inside and explore the cabin's seven compartments firsthand. There's a living quarters, a control room, a medical isolation room, a latrine, and a shower, along with some torpedo compartments, navigation equipment, a hydroacoustics cabin, and an air supply system. During guided tours, guests learn about what life on a submarine is like. The tours are offered in multiple languages and have become a big hit among tourists from other cities. Number 9. Dundas Castle A castle in the woods? Is this a Disney movie? Not quite. During the late 19th century, architect Bradford Gilbert designed a summer retreat for himself and his wife in Roscoe, New York. Known as Beaverkill Lodge, the home was nestled in a forest in the Catskill Mountains. The couple enjoyed the property until 1903 when they sold it to a new owner. A wealthy businessman named Ralph Wirtz Dundas bought the home in 1907 with plans to expand the existing structure into a mansion resembling a fairy tale castle. He imported a lot of the materials from Europe, including the Italian marble that he used for building the floors, fireplaces, and staircases. The castle grew to include 30 rooms, but Dundas died in 1921 before it was finished being built. His wife Josephine had a history of mental illness and struggled to cope with her husband's death. She ended up in a sanatorium a year after Ralph passed away. The couple's daughter Muriel inherited the homestead, but she never lived there. After getting married in 1930, she moved to England. Soon enough, Muriel began showing signs of mental instability as well and was committed to a sanatorium just like her mother had been. Meanwhile, the castle remained empty and neglected. In 1949, Muriel sold the property to an African-American chapter of the Freemasons for $47,000. The fraternity originally planned to use the castle as a home for the elderly and indigent, but the plan failed to pan out. Instead, they turned it into a resort and recreational center as well as a summer camp for inner-city youth. The site still partially functions as a camp, but the castle was abandoned and became derelict at some point over the years. A new owner bought the property in 2018. Number 8. The Enchanted Forest of Aureus The small village of Aureus in northeastern Spain is home to a seemingly enchanted forest filled with a collection of carved rock figurines. Most of them resemble the famous heads of Easter Island, but there are other shapes including a giant elephant. The sculptures were allegedly crafted by local artists who left their signatures on a stone at the site. There are many legends attached to the statues. Based on their placement, some people suspect that they might have mystical or mythical significance. Others believe that a community of gnomes or dwarves live in and around the sculptures, including a strange rock that has a door and is big enough to fit a few people inside. Located roughly an hour's drive outside Barcelona, the whimsical site offers an intriguing escape from the city for those who manage to find it. Number 7. Fordlandia Henry Ford dreamed of creating a community based on the values that made the Ford Motor Company successful. He was iconic for revolutionizing the assembly line and also had a reputation for treating and paying his employees well. This made them better workers, he believed, and in turn, it made the company look good. In 1928, Ford saw an opportunity to bring this vision of a utopian workers' community to life. At the time, the price of Sri Lankan rubber was skyrocketing, leading him to search for a new source for the raw material. If the Ford Motor Company could produce its own rubber for tires, it would cut costs considerably. The settlement, known as Fordlandia, would be in the Amazon jungle in northern Brazil, which seemed like an ideal place for growing rubber trees. Located along the Tapajos River, the property was raised and would naturally prevent flooding. Construction materials could only be transported to the site during the rainy season, but workers managed to build homes, hospitals, schools, a cafe, a dance hall, a golf course, a sawmill, and more. The complications only continued from there. Numerous efforts to grow rubber trees failed, even after experts were called in to help. 
In the meantime, the sense of community at Fordlandia wasn't anywhere near as idyllic as Ford had envisioned. American workers were housed in a separate, nicer part of Fordlandia, while Brazilian workers were put in an area that lacked a nice view and had no running water. Skilled employees were also given better accommodations than entry-level workers. These divisions led to tensions among the workforce. Things reached a boiling point in 1930 when a fight broke out between a brick mason and his supervisor. Workers rallied behind the mason and began vandalizing and destroying the city. Managers escaped by ship and had to return with the military to suppress the riot. Despite all this, Fordlandia remained in operation until Ford died in 1947. His grandson, Henry Ford II, inherited the company. His first order of business was to cut costs, and he sold Fordlandia back to the Brazilian government for just $250,000 after his grandfather invested more than $20 million in the property. In the following years, the population dropped to around 100. But Fordlandia is seeing a revival and now has around 3,000 residents who have started to reoccupy the rusting, derelict buildings. Have you heard of this place before? Let us know in the comments below, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 6. Bohemian Villages After World War II ended, more than 50 displaced German villages and hamlets in the Bohemian Forest along the Czech border were abandoned. The zone remained off-limits to the public until the 1990s when it opened up to visitors interested in seeing the derelict cottages, schools, churches, and other buildings. Some of the settlements have all but vanished, with little to no visible traces remaining. Others are filled with the ruins of buildings or are in the process of being uncovered. In recent years, numerous buildings have been excavated in the former village of Lucina, including a church, pub and brewery, as well as a cemetery. One abandoned settlement, known as Nuratov, has been re-inhabited by around 250 residents. Around 80% of them live with disabilities. They've turned the village into a self-sustaining and accommodating community that has pretty much everything they want or need, including a school, grocery store, souvenir shop, pub, cafe, and more. Number 5. Daddy Park during the 1950s, a Belgian priest named Gaston de Ware wanted to give bored kids something to do while their parents visited the nearby Basilica of Our Lady of Dadizel, which is a popular pilgrimage site. So he built a playground and started expanding it into an amusement park a few years later. By 1980, it was filled with rides and had gotten rid of all its playground equipment. Known as Daddy Park, it was the country's first private amusement park. De Ware made sure that the admission stayed affordable so that the local kids could visit, as well as the children of tourists who visited during religious pilgrimages. At its peak, the park welcomed a million visitors annually. But the rides became run down over time, and in 2000 a little boy lost his arm in a horrifying accident. The park closed down shortly after that, citing plans to renovate. But no updates were ever made and Daddy Park never reopened. Nature reclaimed the property as plans were made to demolish the rusting rides and attractions. The site became popular with urban explorers before finally being torn down in recent years. Number 4. Sarajevo Olympic Village Sarajevo hosted the Winter Olympics in 1984, marking the first time the Games took place in a communist country. Like with most other cities, an entire Olympic village and all the necessary facilities were built for the event. As soon as the Games were over, these structures were abandoned and soon became reclaimed by nature. Less than a decade later, Sarajevo was ravaged by civil war. Many of the former Olympic venues were destroyed, while others remained deserted as the siege continued for four straight years. Some of the structures were repurposed for war-related uses. The Olympic Hotel functioned as a prison and a bobsled track became an artillery stronghold. Today, the crumbling ruins consist of what's left of the bobsled track, a ski jumping venue, spectator stands, and more. The structures are covered in graffiti and overgrowth. Kosovo Stadium, where the welcoming ceremony was held, has been taken over by stray dogs. Abandoned Olympic venues are a persistent problem among host countries and cities, especially those that aren't particularly rich and who have no use for the multi-billion dollar facilities once the games end. If the government can afford it, they often demolish the fixtures. But this isn't always an option, and it's also a waste of money to upkeep the buildings. So the easiest and most affordable thing to do is to ignore their presence as they deteriorate into nothing. Number 3. Bailitz Heilstatten Hospital Located roughly 30 miles outside Berlin, Beilitz Heilstätten is an enormous complex that was originally built as a tuberculosis sanatorium during the late 19th century. It consists of around 60 buildings and was once the world's largest treatment center for tuberculosis and other lung diseases. During World War II, the site functioned as a field hospital for wounded soldiers. Adolf Hitler was admitted there in 1916 for a leg injury he occurred in the Battle of the Somme. That first visit marked the beginning of his involvement with Beilitz Heilstätten, which the Nazis used as a field hospital during World War II. 
Red Army forces occupied the property in 1945 and stayed there until 1994 when they finally cleared out following the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union's collapse. Parts of the complex are still in use today, but most of the buildings are abandoned aside from their occasional use as movie sets and as an attraction for urban explorers. The decaying buildings stand seemingly frozen in time with their elegant yet haunting architecture set against the backdrop of the surrounding forest. They're mostly empty minus a handful of items, including two pianos that were left behind. Visitors can access Beilitz Heilstätten via a 700-foot-long pathway called Baumundzeit, or Tree and Time. Number 2. Esqueleto Hotel in 1953, construction began on what was supposed to be a 16-story hotel in the middle of the tropical forest outside Rio de Janeiro. The building continued for 19 grueling years before bankruptcy forced the developers to abandon the project. For nearly half a century, it has sat in the woods as an unfinished shell with no elevator or any other fixtures to make it livable, earning it the nickname of the Esqueleto, or Skeleton Hotel. This didn't stop street dwellers and criminals from turning the decaying structure into their home at one point. They eventually cleared out, and now the site mostly attracts curious urban explorers. Those who are brave enough to climb the exposed staircase, which has no railing all the way to the top, are rewarded with a stunning view from the top of the building. Loose bricks and broken concrete litter the floors of the graffiti-covered ghost hotel that never was, and the surrounding wilderness has started to encroach upon the property. It's quite obviously decaying and is starting to stick out like a sore thumb. But it's still there for people to enjoy, and for now, its structural integrity seems to be holding out. Number 1. Carbide Wilson Ruins Back in the late 19th century, a little-known Canadian inventor named Thomas Carbide Wilson developed a process for creating an industrial chemical called calcium carbide. Later in his career, he built a lavish summer home and laboratory in what is now Gatineau Park, just outside Ottawa. Rumor has it that Wilson built the property deep in the forest because he was paranoid that competitors would spy on him and steal his ideas. By then, Wilson was focused on making innovations in the fertilizer industry. He began experimenting with ways to pack more phosphoric acid into the material. The eccentric inventor expanded his estate as his needs for space to carry out his work increased. He even built an experimental power station next to nearby Lake Meech. It was often blamed for dramatically raising and lowering the lake's water levels. Wilson eventually ran into money problems after failing to meet his product's production demands. He went bankrupt and handed the estate over to one of his investors who neglected the property and let it fall into disrepair. What's left of the home still stands as a hollowed-out shell of its former self. Number 9. A Polish Jet The small village of Wolka Nasowska in eastern Poland is home to just 400 residents. This tiny town drew the attention of thousands of internet users in 2019 when an overhead image of an abandoned plane surrounded by trees began circulating online. The photo first appeared on an Instagram page belonging to a photographer from North Wales named Tom Dolman. Journalist Christoph Basil tracked Dolman down to ask him about what drew him to a tiny village in the middle of nowhere to take snapshots of an aircraft hidden in a grove of trees. Basil was skeptical of the picture's authenticity, believing that perhaps Dolman had photographed the grove and pasted the airplane into it. Dolman confirmed that the photo was, in fact, genuine. To prove it, he provided the map coordinates of its location to Basil. A closer look revealed that the jet is situated next to a house, leading the writer to speculate that perhaps it belongs to the homeowners. The jet is a Polish jet trainer called the PZLTS-11 Iskra. Designed during the early 1960s, it was the first domestically developed Polish jet aircraft. Exactly 424 were built between 1963 and 1987. The PZLTS-11 Iskra was used by the Polish and Indian Air Forces, serving as the principal training aircraft for the Polish Air Force for over 50 years. Dolman told Basil that he first spotted the plane while traveling the Polish countryside with a group of friends. He noticed its wings sticking out of the grove and made plans to return to the site when the weather was more favorable. After taking several aerial snapshots, the photographer returned to Britain and perfected his favorite shot before posting it to his Instagram. Dolman never expected the photo to go viral. In fact, he was worried that his friends might even think it was boring. But the intriguing photo quickly racked up thousands of likes among friends and strangers alike. Number 8. A T-34 Tank Introduced in 1940, the Soviet-built T-34 tank was famously used by the Red Army during Operation Barbarossa. It quickly earned a reputation for being superior to German tanks, and some Nazi leaders even admitted that they knew it was better than the equipment they were stuck working with. Numerous countries have used the T-34, including Angola, Yugoslavia, Egypt, Afghanistan, China, and more. Consequently, there are numerous abandoned T-34 tanks throughout the world. One of the most iconic examples, nicknamed Stompy, can be found in London. 
It was originally used by the Czech Army and was decommissioned and sold following the dissolution of Czechoslovakia in 1993. From there, the tank went to London, where it was used as a prop in the British film Richard III. After that, a local scrap dealer named Russell Gray bought the T-34 as a gift for a son. But he saw a better use for it as a tool for revenge against the local council, whom he was in an ongoing dispute with over their refusal to let him redevelop a plot of land. Gray parked the vehicle on the property and positioned its gun turret toward the council's office. The council had previously approved Gray's request to install a tank at the site, but they had mistakenly assumed he was referring to a septic tank in his application. The tank remains parked at the site to this day. It's become a celebrated local fixture and is frequently painted over by graffiti artists. When the pandemic hit, it was painted blue in support of England's National Health Service. It has since been painted green, and in keeping with tradition, its color will undoubtedly change again at some point in the near future. Number 7. Train Cars in the Mountains while it's not unusual for trains to travel through wounded and remote areas, it's certainly surprising to stumble upon one sitting neglected in the forest, especially since most retired cars end up in train graveyards before ultimately being scrapped, dismantled, or repurposed. But every now and then, old train cars are parked somewhere seemingly random and simply left to rot. In 2019, obscure Vermont blogger Chad Abramovich trudged through waist-deep snow to explore some abandoned train cars deep in the woods of New Hampshire's White Mountains. About a quarter mile into his trek, he spotted three coaches and two other cars, including a coal car. The electric-powered cars originally belonged to the Erie and Lackawanna Railroad. The Conway Scenic Railroad bought them during the 1990s with plans to restore them, but they ultimately ended up at their current site, where they seem to have been forgotten by everyone except curious urban explorers. Abramovich noted that the abandoned train cars weren't as big of a secret as he initially thought, based on the graffiti covering their interiors. He captured photos of the dilapidated cars, debris-covered floors, and old seats with torn cushions and paint chipping from the armrests. It's clear based on the images that the cars are extremely rusty and in poor shape, with a pile of snow having fallen through the roof and accumulated on the floor in one of them. There's also an old, filthy toilet, and evidence that past visitors treated the old vehicles as a party space. Number 6. Rare Ferrari The Ferrari 166 Berchetta is widely considered the car that made the company. Incredibly rare, only 25 of the 1952-liter V12 model were ever made. At the time, Ferrari had only been in business for three years. In 2007, a man named Manny del Arroz bought one of these extremely rare cars after it was found in the backyard of a home in Scottsdale, Arizona. Describing the rare find, Monterey-based automotive historian Michael T. Lynch retold the tale of how the car ended up where it was eventually discovered. During the 1950s, a man living in Europe found the abandoned 166M at a used car showroom in Lausanne, Switzerland. He called his friend Reg Lee Litton, a car enthusiast who lived in Scottsdale, and Litton told the man to go ahead and buy the car for him. After paying somewhere between $5,000 and $8,000 for the vehicle, Litton's friend had it shipped to California. Litton picked the Ferrari up in Long Beach and drove it back to Scottsdale, where he raced against his friends who owned Maseratis and other sports cars. He drove it until something broke, and then he parked it in his backyard and covered it with some rugs and plastic. At some point, someone took the rugs for some other purpose, leaving the Ferrari exposed to the elements. It sat in Litton's yard until he died. His children managed to sell the weathered car to De La Rose through a series of intermediaries for over $1 million. The buyer did some research and found out that the vehicle had run in historic races like Le Mans, Silverstone, and Targa Florio. A closer look during a mechanical rebuild revealed the date 6949 etched into the motor which meant that it was driven by former racing champion Juan Manuel Fangio. Talk about an incredible find! How many valuable cars do you think are somewhere in similar condition? Tell us in the comments below and don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already! Number 5. Roadside Tank In 2020, the Nebraska State Patrol received reports about a trailer carrying a so-called tank sitting on the shoulder of an entrance ramp to Interstate 80, a 460-mile highway that cuts through the heart of the American Midwest. It was an extremely unusual sight, especially since the drive along this rural route is typically rather uneventful, marked by little more than cornfields, plains, and the open sky. Troopers reported to the scene just outside the town of Overton and found that the truck driver was nowhere to be seen. They observed that it was carrying an armored vehicle with no guns attached, meaning it technically wasn't a tank, but it looked a lot like one. The patrol determined that the vehicle belonged to the South Dakota National Guard and had hired a company to move it back to the state after it was used for a training exercise in California. But the troopers were unsure of where the driver was or why he left his truck and trailer on the roadside. They reassured the public that they were actively seeking the driver but never provided any follow-up about the situation. The vehicle eventually left its parking spot alongside the highway, 
so it's probably safe to assume that it must have reached its destination. Number 4. A Boeing in Bali Just minutes from southern Bali's bustling Pandawa Beach, there's an abandoned quarry that feels worlds away. It's home to an abandoned Boeing 737 passenger jet that looks like it was just randomly plopped down onto the property one day. The site is located along a busy highway, making it a popular stop for curious tourists. But anyone who goes there looking for answers about how or why the plane ended up there is bound to be disappointed. No one seems to know the story behind the aircraft's presence, and if anyone does, they're staying quiet about it. According to local rumors, there were plans to turn the plane into a restaurant when the owner ran out of money. But these claims are unverified, and perhaps the uncertainty surrounding the aircraft is precisely what keeps a steady stream of visitors coming to check things out for themselves. Either way, the owner of the private property is happy to profit from the attraction. After the site began attracting tourists, they installed a gated fence and hired a security guard to ensure that anyone who wants to take a look around pays for the privilege. The 737 is one of at least four abandoned planes of unknown origins throughout Bali, including two other 737s and a McDonnell Douglas DC-10. Little is known about how any of these aircraft ended up at their current resting places, but a lot of speculation hinges on the suspicion of failed business ventures. What do you think is the story behind these planes abandoned in the Balinese province of Indonesia? Share your theories in the comments below and make sure to like and subscribe. Number 3. Thailand's Airplane Graveyard The Ram Kham Hang suburb outside of Bangkok, Thailand is home to a collection of rusting planes, including a Boeing 747 and two McDonnell Douglas MD-82s. Since their arrival at the site in 2010, the aircraft have become a tourist attraction with a reputation as one of the world's most unusual abandoned places due to its proximity to people's homes. The property is owned by a Thai businessman who sells parts for scrap. And while visitors find it fascinating, it seems to be the source of some major ongoing problems. Over the years, the site has increasingly become an eyesore. It's littered with plane parts and partially dismantled aircrafts, which have been stripped of their seating, overhead compartments, and other fixtures. Three homeless families were quick to set up headquarters on the airplane wasteland, which gave them the chance to make some cash by charging an entry fee of anywhere from 100 to 800 baht, 3 to 25 US dollars. They made the interiors as cozy as possible and have told the press that it beats living on the street. While the families aren't particularly bothersome to the property owner or anyone else, living in a dilapidated old airplane raises some safety concerns. Last year, nearby residents noticed smoke spewing from one of the planes, along with a strong chemical odor. Thankfully, fire crews managed to get the blaze under control. They noticed that it appeared to have started in dry grass, but were unsure of the exact cause. Number 2. Bugatti Veyron it's not very unusual for cars to be found in bodies of water, but most of the time they end up there by accident. This wasn't the case for a 2006 Bugatti Veyron purchased by a Galveston, Texas businessman named Andy House in 2009. House paid $1 million for the car and insured it for $2.2 million as a collector's item. But instead of treating it like a collector's item, he used it to run errands and needlessly showed it off during joyrides. One day, someone saw House driving the car in Lamarck and began filming it, most likely because a car this luxurious is not an everyday sight in the small city. Things got weird when House drove the Veyron into the Gulf Bay and simply let it sink. He left the motor running, which caused it to take on large amounts of salt water and ultimately destroyed the engine. House allegedly gave a few different stories about what happened, first claiming that he was reaching for his phone and that he accidentally swerved into the lake. He also blamed a low-flying pelican and reportedly said that mosquitoes attacked him once the vehicle hit the water. Unfortunately for him, the entire incident was caught on camera. The footage, which appeared on YouTube, showed no signs of House trying to break, avoiding a pelican, or fighting off mosquitoes. The authorities accused House of filing a false insurance claim on the Veyron. He was sentenced to a year in federal prison followed by three years of probation, and was ordered to pay back the $600,000 settlement. Number 1. Jaguar XJ220 Manufactured between 1992 and 1994, the incredibly rare XJ220 was one of Jaguar's most unexpectedly successful models. During that time, it was the fastest production car ever built, topping out at 212.3 miles per hour at the Nardo test track in Italy. A group of Jaguar employees designed the XJ220 during their spare time as part of their shared vision for a modern version of the company's racing cars of the 1950s and 60s. The demand for high-performance cars dropped during its production years due to the onset of the early 90s recession, and only 275 were ever made. Given its rarity and the fact that it's valued at over half a million dollars, it's easy to assume that anyone who owns an XJ220 would take really good care of it. 
But this isn't the case, as Crank and Pistons Mike Bramley learned when he discovered a black XJ220 in the Qatari desert, where it had clearly gone without proper maintenance for quite some time. It's a shame that the owner neglected the car, which went down in history as one of the few Jaguar models known for its speed. Number 8. LA's Deserted Underground Tunnels it's probably safe to assume that not many people spend much time thinking about subterranean infrastructure. In fact, many towns and small cities operate mainly above ground. But in some places, entire networks of tunnels were built to keep things running smoothly or secretively. And just like any other type of building, many have been abandoned over the years. In many cases, these labyrinths functioned as a space-saving mechanism in crowded cities that lack space on ground level. In the 1920s, the city of Los Angeles built a subway system that serviced hundreds of trolley cars daily, even as competition from the automobile became an ever-present looming threat. Ridership peaked during World War II, but the city's five subway lines were all retired by 1955 and replaced with a street-level bus system. Parts of the abandoned tunnels were filled in, but most of them still sit unused beneath the LA streets. They represent just a portion of the city's dark, dirty, and forgotten underground passageways, including 11 miles of service tunnels that house several basement speakeasies during the Prohibition era. LA's tunnels have also reportedly been used for transporting large sums of money and shuttling high-profile criminals to court. One of these labyrinthine networks is rumored to be accessible via an easy-to-miss elevator behind the city's Hall of Records building. Inside, visitors could expect to encounter long, dimly lit passageways filled with iron gates, old machinery, large mysterious chutes, random office furniture, and boxes that appear to contain paperwork. Honestly, there's not much going on in the tunnels beneath Los Angeles today, but the city is as busy as ever above ground. And it's for this exact reason that these networks give off the wildly deceptive impression of a forgotten city whose golden era is long over. Number 7. Trenton Psychiatric Hospital Opened in 1848, the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum was New Jersey's first public mental hospital. It was founded by Dorothea Dix, an advocate for the mentally ill, but the hospital turned into a house of horrors after Dr. Henry Cotton took over as the new medical director. Believing that untreated syphilis infections were the source of mental illness, he made it customary to mutilate patients through needless surgeries. Dr. Cotton also removed patients' teeth parts of the stomach, the gallbladder, and other organs and body parts. He claimed that these procedures had an 85% cure rate, which is obviously questionable in hindsight, especially since many patients died under his care. Nevertheless, Dr. Cotton's practices remained in place into the 1960s, decades after he passed away. When the hospital finally stopped these brutal treatment methods, several of its wings were abandoned and left to decay. Part of the site is still in use, and it remains controversial to this day, although the problems have less to do with the doctors and revolve mainly around patient-on-patient -patient violence. The deserted sections of the hospital are in disarray. Old, broken, and dirty furniture fills the rooms. Paint is peeling from the walls, and graffiti is scrawled on the walls and fixtures of a dark auditorium. Floors are scattered with artwork, computers, personal belongings, old ceiling tiles, an old piano, and medical equipment, including stretchers, walkers, blood transfusion supplies, and wheelchairs. There are signs on the doors reminding staff to keep them locked at all times, and piles of boxes filled with old paperwork. Now known as the Trenton Psychiatric Hospital, the dilapidated facility is one of the few abandoned asylums in New Jersey that haven't been torn down. It's closed to the public, but those who are curious can take a virtual tour courtesy of an abandoned New Jersey documentary featuring the hospital. Number 6. Musliumovo the 1986 nuclear accident at the Chernobyl power plant went down in history as the world's worst nuclear disaster. It's so famous that its popularity overshadows another major nuclear incident that happened in Siberia 29 years earlier. 
During the 1950s, one of Russia's biggest dumping grounds for radioactive materials could be found along the banks of the Tachar River in the Ural Mountains. Between 1949 and 1956, the Mayak nuclear complex dumped billions of cubic feet of waste into the river. Then in 1957, a load of highly toxic waste exploded at Mayak, releasing copious amounts of radioactivity into the air. The Soviet government kept the incident quiet, which was pretty easy to do since the remote facility was kept secret from the public. As many as 270,000 people were affected, but the authorities didn't bother to tell most of them. Some residents were moved right away, while others were simply left to carry on with their lives as usual. It wasn't until the collapse of the Soviet Union during the 1990s that the gravity of the disaster became widely known. In 2009, more than 50 years after the accident, residents of the hardest-hit village, Muslimova, were given the choice to either relocate or receive a $30,000 payout. But many who chose the payout never received received it, while others were swindled by crooked real estate agents. Villagers who opted to relocate were moved just a mile down the road. Their new village, Novo Muslimovo, is well within the contamination zone. Most of the homes in the old village were destroyed, while others were disassembled and moved to the new village. But some buildings remain, including an abandoned school. In fact, not everyone has left Muslimovo. A handful of residents, mostly belonging to the Tatar ethnic group, are stuck living in what's left of the community because they allegedly lack the proper documents to qualify for help with relocating. The nuclear plant still operates today and many believe that it continues to dump hazardous waste into the river. Residents of both the new and old Muslimovo are plagued by health problems from the radiation. When Radio Free Europe journalists visited the area and snapped photos, they were confronted by the police. It seems as though the government remains intent on keeping the far-reaching effects of the disaster as quiet as possible. Number 5. River Country Water Park as many as 30 million guests visit Walt Disney theme parks each year. With the exception of a months-long closure amid the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, these amusement parks are almost never empty. So it's hard to imagine what they would look like in a post-apocalyptic world. But if you've visited the Contemporary Resort or ridden the Space Mountain roller coaster at Walt Disney World in Orlando, perhaps you caught a glimpse of a nearby abandoned and overgrown water park. River Country was Disney's first water park. It opened in 1976 and was in business for 25 years before shuttering its doors in 2001. The park closed simply because it was losing business to Disney's newer water parks and evidently wasn't worth keeping open. It didn't take long for nature to reclaim the deserted slides, bridges, and other fixtures at River Country. Vines wrapped themselves around signs, dead trees fell onto water slides, and vegetation grew on walkways and staircases. Trespassing onto the site came with major risks, including a lifetime ban from Disney's theme parks. So most people only caught a glimpse of River Country from afar before it was demolished in recent years. But a few photographers managed to access the decaying water park while it was still there and captured snapshots of the eerily dismal moss-covered ruins. Number 4. Salton Sea Resorts and Beaches the Salton Sea is a saline lake in Southern California that has dried up and reappeared several times. Measuring 35 by 15 miles, the current body of water was formed in 1905 when flooding from the Colorado River broke through a canal gate. By the time repairs were made two years later, the Salton Basin was filled with water for the first time since the 16th century. It became a popular holiday destination during the 1950s and 60s. Hotels, resorts, and vacation homes popped up along the lake's eastern and western shores. But business owners and visitors were blissfully unaware that the Salton Sea was not there to stay. It exists as part of a cycle that repeats every 400 to 500 years and will eventually disappear. This starts to happen when the sea's freshwater source runs dry. There's also no drainage outlet. These conditions increase the water's saline levels and cause it to evaporate. 
The first signs of trouble in the Salton Sea appeared during the 1970s, when pollution from agricultural runoff killed entire animal populations, spread diseases, and made the salty environment even less hospitable to wildlife. In the meantime, farmers began to use water more efficiently, leading to less runoff into the lake. Increasing amounts of hazardous dust got blown into the air as more of the seabed became exposed. No vacationer wants to breathe toxic air, hang out on a beach where hundreds of dead fish routinely wash ashore, or swim in heavily polluted water that smells like rotten eggs. Tourists stopped coming to the Salton Sea, residents moved away, and the once bustling neighborhoods and resorts became like ghost towns. Many of these summery pastel-colored buildings are still here today, acting as a sad reminder of the region's bygone glory days. Weathered resort signs, broken-down vintage cars, deserted campers and boats, and empty graffiti-covered swimming pools that once sat just feet from the water stand helplessly as the shoreline gets further and further away. The shrinking sea is no longer safe for swimming, boating, or fishing. Although there are barely any fish living in it at this point, and has created one of the biggest public health and environmental emergencies in modern history. Number 3. Texola The arrival of Route 66 brought prosperity to many of America's small towns, but the construction of new interstate highways bypassed many of these places, leaving them struggling and in some cases abandoned entirely. One such town known as Texola is in western Oklahoma. It was originally a farm town, but the tourism that came along with Route 66 soon became a cornerstone of the local economy. During its heyday, Texola's population peaked at nearly 600 residents, but the catastrophic Dust Bowl period during the 1930s and the arrival of the nearby I-40 in the early 1970s drove people to move elsewhere in search of better prospects. By 1980, the population fell to 100, and today, there are now only a few dozen residents still living there. While it hasn't quite achieved ghost town status, Texola certainly resembles a ghost town. It's filled with abandoned historic buildings, including an old gas station, a one-cell jail with a vintage truck parked outside, and numerous homes, bars, and restaurants that stand eerily empty. The town is also home to the Tumbleweed Grill and Country Store. It's the oldest operating restaurant along Route 66. Texola is just one of many similar towns that the historic road passes through. Some say that driving Route 66 is like stepping back in time, while others compare it to a post-apocalyptic wasteland. There are even sections of the road that are unpaved, including the infamous Jericho Gap in Texas, where travelers were known to get their vehicles stuck in the mud. Locals were welcoming to the stranded tourists, who brought so much business to Jericho that it could no longer survive after that section of the road was rerouted during the 1930s. Number 2. Tawarga Violence often forces residents to flee their own town or city and complicates their ability to return. This is what happened to the 48,000 inhabitants of Tawarga, Libya, who were displaced by civil war in 2012. They were uprooted by militias who took control of the city and proceeded to destroy it in an apparent attempt to stop anyone from coming back. In the wake of an uprising civil war that saw the ousting of Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi, the rebel forces accused Tawarga's residents of supporting the disgraced former leader. A peace charter was signed in 2018, finally allowing residents to return to the city, or what's left of it, rather with no electricity, running water, or telecommunications, and extremely limited education and medical care, Tawarga's infrastructure was devastated. Many, if not most of its utility plants, hospitals, schools, homes, shops, and administrative buildings were destroyed. In addition to the physical damage, many residents chose not to return out of fear. They dismissed the peace treaty as Muslim Brotherhood propaganda and worried that they would be attacked if they went back to Tawarga. As of mid-2021, less than 7,000 people had returned to Tawarga. That number is suspected to be increasing, but the city reportedly remains mostly uninhabitable and empty. Number 1. Imber 
Located in a remote part of England's Salisbury Plain, the small isolated village of Imber dates back to pre-Roman times. From the beginning, the community was somewhat separated from the outside world. Many of its residents were farmers, and the nearest market town was several miles away. The population peaked at 440 during the 1850s. Britain's Ministry of Defense began slowly buying up the village during the 1890s. In 1943, the government evicted the remaining 150 residents so it could use the property for military training exercises. They were given just 47 days to leave, but most people complied because they saw it as their duty to help the war effort and because they were told that they could return within six months. But even after the conflict ended, villagers were banned from returning to Imber. Many homes were destroyed, but several crumbling buildings remain, including a pub, a schoolhouse, and a deserted military village. The Ministry of Defense still uses the land for army training, but the ghost village is open to the public for 50 days every year. And the St. Giles Church is occasionally open for services. It's the only remaining intact building thanks to the church's conservation trust a non-profit dedicated to preserving England's historic churches. An extensive restoration effort and regular maintenance have left it looking strangely out of place against the backdrop of visibly decrepit structures that fill the rest of Imber. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn about more apocalyptic places, let us know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe. See you next time.